I started out with the last talk, um, was looking at <clears throat> the idea of ritual as play, and this is a continuation, so I'm just going to briefly go over it. This is uh, based on an article by, his name is Richard Sharp, who, you'll remember, he's the guy who kind of used the notion of play as it developed that a child at some point in life is able to take a stick and play with it and it will be a gun or it will be a horse or anything he wants and the idea is that he, he sees it and can play with it as a horse or a gun or whatever it is in his play but he doesn't misrepresent it he knows it's a stick and he's able to and we all are able to make that distinction and jump back and forth between those kind of that cognitive understanding. And what Sharp's uh, notion is, is that ritual can be seen as providing that, that experience. And um, his thesis is, and, I, and I'm not sure I altogether buy it, but his thesis is, is that through ritual, as particularly Zen ritual, we can come to see not only the emptiness of the ritual, that is, it's an arbitrary and social constructed thing. We make it up. It's not some God given, divine, divinely inspired uh, uh, set of rules, but that we can put ourselves in a situation where we um, move into the sacred, but also not understand it. Those rules are arbitrary. I use the example of the, the center line that we bow to. We know that we should bow, we do bow, but we also know that this is something that somebody somewhere along the line made it up, and that we're not going to be we're not going to be struck dead if we, if we cross it. And one sits as if one were an enlightened Buddha. And it's this last one that we're going to look at in this next article, which is by Daniel Layton. And it's simply called Zazen as Ritual. And I, this caught my eye because, um, you know, I guess I never really thought about Zazen as ritual per se. It occurred to me that in most religions, or many religions, and you can think of one in particular, if you saw a cartoon like this, you would be outraged. Mm -hmm. and, um, and probably other religions as well. Uh, the kind of flexibility that Sharp is talking about, which he sees as being part of Zen, uh, you know, has this other extreme, which we usually call fundamentalism, and that's where somebody literally believes that such and such is such and such and so forth. So uh, the, the thing about Buddhism, I think, in general, is, is that we are able to kind of make jokes about it or have fun with it and, and enjoy it and so forth. And you know, and I've also thought about my parents who were were church-going Christians and so forth. <coughs> they seem to have a certain flexibility about their notion of what what the whole thing was about. They 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 realized to some extent that going to church, going through the ritual, going through and and talking about what God wills and so forth and so on. But there's always sort of a kind of a lightness to it. It seems to be almost a sense of humor to it. And again, I think when it, when that is lost, then you're usually moving into the realm of, of fundamentalism. So when Roshi stops in the middle of his service and cracks a joke or points out or something, or starts it, you know, I, apparently somebody got incensed when that happened. Um, but I I think that's all characteristic with what I see is, hey, we're doing this, we're doing it together. We, let's take it seriously to the extent that we're all doing it together. But let's don't take it too, too seriously. Now, what I'd like to do is we'll quickly go through kind of the arguments that, that um, Leighton pulls together. We start off in the Rajana branch, Rajarana. Rajarana branch of Buddhism. Practitioners are initiated into ritual practices of identification with specific Buddha or Bodhisattva figures. Um, and he doesn't spend a whole lot of time with this, but I, I, I suspect. It has to do with the, the importance of visualization in particularly Tibetan uh, Buddhism. And apparently, you know, people are 
invited to or are given the opportunity to experience themselves as a particular god or deity or Buddha, Buddha figure. Uh, and he, he claims that there's some degree of spillover from this into early, early Zen. And again, I think you know, he doesn't really go into it, and I, I don't know enough to say how or when that happened and so forth, but it would seem to be an early development. Second, he says, when we think of the goal of Buddhism as enlightenment, we think of it mainly as an attainment of some kind of higher understanding. But Buddhahood is a physical transformation as much as a mental transcendence. This is not, this is a, a quote from Robert Thurman. Thurman also has this quote, actually I saw it in the Zen calendar. He says, we always hear about practice, but what about performance? And um, it, he's, his <coughs> take on uh, Buddhism and, and it seems to be that it's in line with this whole idea of performance that you know what we're, we're, we're really not we're not so much in, interested in what's going on mentally or internally the proof of the pudding basically is what's going on in the body how how we act and how we talk and how we express express ourselves third one dignified manners is Buddha Dharma the Quran is the essential teaching this is uh, just a, given as a late sort of Zen uh, prescription. Dignified manner. Now, you know, when I heard that, um, I was taken back and reminded me of something I read by uh, one of the early books by um, Stephen Batchelor, where he said, you know, what, what this is all about is giving it, a, attaining a sense of dignity. And when I read that, I thought, you know, that's not really what I want. I don't really care about dignity. And, um, but I have to say, as I get older and become maybe a little more jaded and a little more uh, less idealistic, thinking of, you yeah, know, well, having kind of a dignified life, maybe that's not that, that bad. But I, I thought, you know, dignified manner is the Buddha Dharma. Dignified manner. So just keep that in mind. As we, just as this is the back of Hitting back to Sharp, the early article, the one I talked about last time, but it, I want, it, he brings up this whole idea of the body again. Just as exposure to the training in music is necessary to appreciate the music performance, the appreciation of ritual entails the acquisition of what Bell calls the ritualized body, a body invested with a sense of ritual. So again, we come back to that idea that whatever this thing is that we're aiming for, or whatever perhaps we're calling enlightenment, it, the clues to it are somehow how a person carries himself, expresses himself. Uh, Dogen, the rule, Dogen's rules indicate that he saw it as rules about, I think I paraphrase this, but he's talking about the rules for monks, indicated he saw Zazen along with other ritual practices as communal. Standing out has no benefit, this is Dogen saying this, standing out has no benefit, being different from others is not our practice. So again, you know, this is the kind of thing, if I had come in 10 years ago and saw this, I would say, this is not what I'm signing up for, you know. And so basically what they're saying is that there doesn't seem to be any kind of distinction between ritual and monastic life, ritual and practice. It's all kind of one, one thing. And one of the things we have to grapple with is we do have practice. We practice here. We may practice somewhat at home, but it's not the totality of our life, which means, means it's a very different kind of uh, experience that we're having. The emphasis in Zen training is the mindful and dedicated expression of meditative awareness in everyday activity. So again, another way of sort of talking about it, focusing on the emphasis of actual actions rather than what's going on uh, internally. His, the intimation of Sharp's article is that somehow by going through ritual and seeing the empty numbers, somehow that spills over into everyday life. I, I don't know how you would prove that. I don't know if that's the case or not. I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, uh, but I don't, you know, it's, as, a, as a sociologist, I'm not completely you know, convinced that you can, you can prove that. Now, the problem for me as a sociologist, again, with Leighton, is when it comes down to um, kind of making his argument here that Zazen is ritual and that's an important. Basically, he relies on 
Dogen. And uh, you know, Dogen doesn't say, uh, well, we, you, are, you should sit as if, or you are sitting as if you are a Buddha uh, or are enlightened. You are enlightened. And then comes the, the question for most of us is, eh? You know, <laughs> what do you mean? I'm not enlightened. Why else am I here? What, am, what are you talking about? So, you know, again, it would be nice if Leighton had to go out and go, you know, show his studies and see how people actually deal with this in their head. What, when, the monk, when the monks were told by Dogen that they were Buddha and they're just expressing their natural Buddha nature on the, on the cushion, did they buy it? Or did they not buy it? Did they did they buy it? Did not buy it for a while, and then somehow, as seems to be the case, or at least what Dogen thinks is going to happen, they come to realize that. I mean, that's his notion. You don't know you would do it, but you are, and if you sit, just sit, you will come come to know that. So, you know, um, I like I I think like everybody else, they kind of struggled with that whole notion from day one. And as I understand it, that's what Dogen struggled with throughout his life. It, he, didn't, he, he couldn't figure out how that worked either until quite late in his, in his practice. So uh, this is, you know, this exercise, going through this article, is kind of an exercise for me to try to figure out, well, how, how could I hold this? How, how can I proceed in a way that, that kind of makes sense? And I'm not sure I've completely done it. I think that's probably, you know, a, a, a perhaps a lifelong endeavor. But I'll kind of try to make some comments on it. So let me read this first. The Buddha, Dharma, practice, and enlightenment are one and the same. Because it is the practice of enlightenment, a beginner's wholehearted practice of the way is exactly the totality of original enlightenment. For this reason, in conveying the essential attitude of practice, it is taught not to wait for enlightenment outside of the practice. Now, of course, if we wait, that means we're wanting, we're aspiring to want something that we don't have right now. And my understanding, the simplistic understanding of what the enlightenment is, is being okay with what is, accepting what is. Being one with, I mean, if you want to get mystical about it, one with. What is. And so it makes sense that if, in fact, that's what we're doing on the cushion, sitting around wanting something or waiting for something to happen, that's kind of it's counterproductive. And um, I think whatever, and we've had some interesting discussions about what is enlightenment. And, you know, there's a range of different ideas. And I suspect that for each of us, or enlightenment, is based on our past condition. It's what we've experienced, and, what, and based on what we've experienced throughout the rest of our life, we have an idea of what it is that's out there that we think we want. And um, it's uh, that very process of kind of projecting into the future about something that I don't have right now that seems to get in the way. and. It's, I have to say, in some ways, I was actually talking to Roshi today about how everything seems so bland today as I heard yesterday and today as I sat. And in a way, it had occurred to me maybe that's kind of what equanimity is. Uh, but I kind of miss it. It's the highs and the lows, you know. It's like I want I, I, I want it to be something more than just kind of being with this okay with, with 